It is a, a fantastic day. We're delighted. We don't even have a standing room. And I hope you're eating. For the new students, I do all the cooking, so enjoy the food. I try to season it very well for you, okay? All right. We are delighted that you're all here at this beginning fall opening meeting. You know we'll have convocation soon also. Um, before I give the State of the uh, University address, I am going to invite to the stage now three dynamic students, an incoming freshman, Jake Duty, an incoming transfer student, Sarah Close, and a graduate student, Christina Ackerman. Would you all please come up and you may begin with either one of the three, the two, two undergrads first and the grad student, okay? Come on, Jake, uh-huh. When you said great. And let me, let me ask Jake's parents to stand because you won't believe their parents are so young, but let you all stand up right now. <laughs> That's great. And Jake's dad, I know, is a teacher in Howard County. Go right ahead. Thank you. In the summer of my junior year of high school, I took a cybersecurity internship at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. At that point, I still wasn't entirely sure about where to apply for college, uh, so I asked my boss about good uh, computer science colleges in the area, and he said that the lab had special priori uh, hiring priority for two different places, Carnegie Mellon and UMBC. Now, if you didn't know much about either college, that would be a confusing thing to say, uh, because you have Carnegie Mellon, which is an intensely private, intensely small, uh, and prestigious college with a hundred years of history and a tuition to match, and uh, uh, dodged a bullet there, and UMBC, which has 14,000 students and is a state school. And at the time, I was surprised because what I knew about UMBC was that it was a good state school with you know, good, good programs and a nice atmosphere, but not much more than that. As my high school career went on, though, I learned more and more about it. It had a small class atmosphere, a president who was well known for an innovative philosophy for education, and of course, fantastic math and computer science programs known the country over that I would ultimately sign up for. I was lucky enough to have attended a very small, private, close-knit high school, uh, so I've only really briefly seen the things that I could be involved in on a much larger scale here at UMBC. Music, athletics, and a really tight sense of community. With this in mind, my biggest priority going forward is balance. Uh, on the one hand, you know, I'm eager to take part in what could be seen as a dizzying array of, of possible activities, but on the other hand, I have to have some self-control in my classes, in the events that I attend, and the people that I surround myself with, or else I might lose steam as the years go on. That being said, standing here before you, I realize I have been incredibly fortunate in my life, due in large part to circumstances that I have done nothing to earn. I believe that with that benefit that I've had, there's a real responsibility, a tangible responsibility, to use what I've been given to the best of my ability. And UMBC is the best place in the nation for me to do that. I look forward to spending a year of seized opportunities with all of you. Thank you. It is an honor to be here today and meet many of the professors and staff. My name is Sarah Close, and I am a transferring from the Community College of Baltimore County, Essex. I was invited to give a little backstory about myself and what brought me to UMBC, and as well as my plans as a student here. My story is a bit personal and daunting, but it is also about resilience. High school was a very rough time for me. It was my sophomore year that it hit me the hardest with the passing of my stepdad. This event was most traumatic due to the fact that he did not die in the most peaceful manner. He unfortunately died from suicide. I had never really experienced that kind of loss or pain before. You never truly appreciate a person and what they mean to you until they are gone. The last few years of high school became even harder. My mother has multiple sclerosis, which inhibits her from working, and her disability benefit was our only source of income. With my stepdad gone and no other form of financial support, my mother and I were on the brink of being homeless. 
We had to move, rely on food pantries to get by, and I had to get a job to help pay the bills. I was so worried about finances and what we were going to eat that when it came to applying for colleges, I was overwhelmed. You never know when something is going to happen. This mindset led me through the last years of high school and now through college. It was not until I started college that I discovered my true passion and decided on the major I am pursuing, psychology. My goal is to become a child psychologist. I became very involved with the CCBC community as I planned to be here at UMBC. While at CCBC, I was a first year experience mentor, which is the equivalent to UMBC's orientation peer advisors or OPAs. I would be asked to give a student voice at orientations, much like the one I'm giving today. I was there to try and empathize with my fellow students. Most of all, I wanted to offer friendly advice to someone who might need someone to lend an ear or just might want advice. My goal was not to have incoming students dwell on my story, but to inspire others to be resilient and to share their gifts with others. I'm a major advocate for mental health and have participated in mental health walks and donated to help support the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. While here at UMBC, I plan to continue my involvement by eventually becoming an OPA myself. <laughs> at CCBC, I also part participated in Alternative Spring Break, where we helped at several food pantries and homeless shelters. It is a personal goal to try and give back as much as possible. When I was going through a rough time, I was grateful that there were people and resources that were there to help in my time of need. I plan to continue this mindset here at UMBC by volunteering my time as much as I can to organizations to give back. My academics are very important to me in my educational career. At CCBC, I was in the honors program and had the amazing opportunity to work with Johns Hopkins University in their Humanities for All program as a Mellon Scholar. I also have made the Dean's List for maintaining my 4.0 GPA throughout my career there. I was also a member of Phi Theta Kappa, which is an honor society for two years colleges. I was honored to be presented with the Presidential Transfer Award to UMBC. <laughs> UMBC offers more opportunities than I have ever been presented before. At CCBC, we would have honors meetings where certain colleges would come in and say a little bit about their colleges has to offer. I was very pleased with what UMBC had to offer. I liked how the location was not too far from home. I liked how it was a smaller school compared to other schools that had been presented. U UMBC feels like a close community, almost family-like. The Honors College was intriguing as well. Um, it is a privilege to be accepted into the Honors College here at UMBC as well. Some clubs that are interest me include the Psi, Psi Chi Honor Society, which is designated to psychology. I will also be joining the organization known as NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I will also take advantage of many internships that are offered as well. Everyone has a different story. College is a whole new experience for some people and opens the doors to many opportunities. Life is all about moving forward, and I believe that success does not just come from working hard, but from having excellent mentors like yourselves to help guide students. I look forward to spending the next couple semesters with the brilliant minds and family known as UMBC. Thank you and welcome back. Um, my name is Christina Ackerman. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I ended up here. <laughs> After getting my bachelor's degree in sociology, I wanted a break. I worked hard. I graduated summa cum laude with several honors. And as much as I loved academia at the time, I wanted nothing more than to leave it. <laughs> Just for a moment. Um, but I didn't. I went into my master's degree in international studies headfirst after graduating. I crossed the finish line on all fours. I was exhausted, I was burned out, I wanted a break, but I didn't take one. <laughs> I went into a career opportunity in international development, a career opportunity so great that I could not pass it up, 
not that I could afford to, anyway. And <laughs> I attempted to maintain the same momentum that I had throughout this entire time. As much as I wanted to take advantage of that opportunity, however, my brain could not stay still. My mind was wandering to all other aspects of my job other than the one that I was doing. In international development, we would look for proposals and opportunities to help countries around the world with their economics, their agriculture, aspects like that. And I wanted to know who was finding out about these opportunities. In the world of development, there is policy and implementation, and then there's research. And I wanted to know who was doing the research, who was finding and investigating, researching all these opportunities for improvement. I think at the heart of my frustrations, what I really wanted to be was a scholar. I had the chance to experience a taste of it when I applied for the opportunity to take part in a conference on world heritage sponsored by Rotary International and UNESCO in Paris, France. I and six other American students went to France. We collaborated and created a project to answer a simple question. How can the preservation of world heritage contribute to world peace? The experience was fun and exhilarating and interesting and enriching and self-sustaining. And when I got back to work to the same walls of my cubicle, I knew that I did not want to be there anymore. So finally, I decided to take that break. I took a leap year, a leap of faith into teaching abroad. I moved to Madrid, Spain and was teaching English at a local high school. Once again, the experience was enriching and wonderful and amazing. And at the same time, I was working on my application for a PhD program. I wanted something different. I wanted an academic career that would be empowered by my own choices, something that I could mold into my own. <laughs> to be confined to a simple discipline, just sociology, international studies. I wanted to pick from all the disciplines that I wanted to have. So that led me to the Interdisciplinary Language, Literacy, and Culture program here at UMBC. I saw all the students who were doing different research projects. They were so niche and so interesting, and I thought, oh, I could fit right in. I could have a neat little home of my own here. Excitedly, I applied. Astonishingly, I was asked to be interviewed, and amazingly, I got accepted. And <laughs> I came back home from Spain to a completely different path than the one that I had left behind, and for that I'm really grateful. I hope all students feel the joy and, and the power of choosing your own education path. We're in a wonderful place to do that here at UMBC. We learn to make a better life for ourselves, and at the same time, we are enriching the world with what we learn here. So I hope everyone has a fulfilling an amazing experience here. I plan to take advantage of every nook and cranny of opportunity, and I hope we all do the same. Thank you. Really, I give them all a round of applause. It's really great. Really great. Amazing stories about realizing that even when you're high achieving, it's not just about you, but about family and support you get, realizing that sometimes the difficulties come and the importance of resilience and grit, appreciating the fact that you have to think through, well, where do I want to go with this? What does this really mean? What is the essence of it? And knowing when you want to connect different disciplines are very inspiring. We're now going to hear from two of our vice presidents. First will be Lynn Schaefer, and then we have our provost, Philip Rouse, and I'll come back after that. Lynn has just been elected chair of the board of the National Association of College and University Business Officers. Give her a big round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So this is one of my favorite presentations to make each year. What's going on with facilities and grounds on UMBC's campus? So we're going to talk about things that were done in the past year, things that are going on right now, and things that are planned for the coming year. Some big, some not so big, some less glamorous than others. I'll let you be the judge of that. So this is a campus map, and you can see the blue dots are those things that have been accomplished this year. Biggest thing, new event center. So 
Our new and long needed event center opened on February 3rd. It has 172,000 square feet over four levels and cost the university $85 million to complete. It includes a 4,700 seat arena for athletic events for basketball and volleyball. And just as exciting, with a maximum capacity of 6,000 seats, including seats on the floor, we were able to bring commencement back to campus this year for the first time in decades. This facility will also host concerts and speakers and other kinds of events for campus life. And here's a picture of that first basketball game, the inaugural event in the event center. A uh, sold out crowd to 4,753 people against the then conference champions, Vermont. <laughs> we renovated two classrooms in Sherman Hall uh, in collaboration with the provost's office and Do It, including new carpeting, ceiling tiles, lighting, and technology to support active learning, including new furniture, which you can see on the after photo here. In addition, facilities management repainted 79 classrooms this summer. We completed renovations in both Erickson and Harbor Hall. That included the public spaces where we uh, put in new finishes and paint and those sorts of things and then put in new showers in all the units that are compliant with handicap accessibility requirements. Okay, here's one of the not so glamorous <laughs> items. This is uh, restrooms in the engineering building. We received a $212,000 grant from the uh, Maryland Department of Disabilities for access, so we created accessible restrooms in the engineering building. Another access issue, uh, the, the lower level of Sondheim and Mass Psych used to only be accessible through stairways. And we've now created this handicap accessible ramp that will get you uh, from the quad and the ILSB into the main campus area. Fourth floor of the administration building. We were able to renovate and reconfigure the entire fourth floor to improve workflow, to accommodate a, a reorganization, and to improve customer service. So you'll see if you, if you go to the fourth floor of the administration building, a new customer service con, uh, counter and a reconfiguration of spaces and that really dark space that used to be there is now bright and inviting. Here's another exciting one. The engineering building's uh, original heat exchanger, this is a heat exchanger, uh, it had, ended, had, had reached the end of its useful life. And so the new heat exchange, exchanger is just about completed and it will provide a more efficient system in providing all of the, for all of the heating and cooling in the building. It's a $1.3 million project. So it's an invisible project to most people, but very important for the comfort of the occupants. We completed our new facilities man uh, master plan this year. It was approved by the Board of Regents in March of 2018 after a two-year process that engaged hundreds of people on campus to give input into what the campus development plan should look like for the next 10 years. We have the a uh, link on this slide for you to go take a look if you're really interested. It's actually a fascinating plan. Want to give special thanks to the facilities management team that, that actually made this happen. Julianne Simpson, Celsor Gatan, Heather Bishop, Sean Holland, Will Wiley, and Joe Rexing. And also a special thanks to the Imaging Research Center who did the 3D modeling that really wowed the Board of Regents. So thank you to all of them. So now on to projects that are currently underway. The blue dots show the construction, what's happening right over the next year, and the green dots are campus beautification efforts. So of course the biggest one is the Interdisciplinary Life Sciences Building that is progressing very rapidly in front of our eyes. This is just an artist's rendering of that project. It is 133,000 square feet 
total cost of $123 million. This one is paid for by the state. Construction began in April of 2017. It's going to be completed about a year from now, actually a year from uh, May uh, in 2019, in time for fall classes in next fall. It is designed to gold lead standards. In that building, there's a big atrium. We are going to have our second art and public places installation in that, in that atrium area. Um, of course, the first one is the forum at the Performing Arts and Humanities Building. The artist that was selected is Volkan Alkanaguru, who is an internationally renowned artist who has many high profile public art installations around the world, and we're very excited. There was a broadly representative group on campus that selected the artist and gave the inspiration for this piece. So can't wait for you all to see it when the building opens uh, less than a year from now. Here is an aerial view of construction project progress and just a quick summary of what you can see, what you'll expect in this building. 50% of the building is dedicated to interdisciplinary research labs, about 25 lab modules. 35% of the building is dedicated to teaching spaces, so eight active learning classrooms, four teaching labs, six seminar and collaborative project rooms, and a good manufacturing processes lab. And then the remaining 15% is in core research facilities, bioprocessing, vivarium, and cell science labs. All right, now here's tricky technology part. We're gonna show you a, a video of the construction. I want you to pay attention and see if you can catch when the crane went up and when the utility tunnel started. And keep an eye out for the seasons too. There's the crane. Leaves are gone. There's the tunnel. <laughs> And soon the leaves will come back. <laughs> there we go. Did you take those pictures every day, Lynn? <laughs> we took those pictures every day, Greg. <laughs> I imagine everybody remembers May 27th and the huge rain, the storms that hit this area. Uh, we came out relatively unscathed at UMBC, but there are several areas on campus that sustained heavy damage, and it's going to be some time before we can uh, fully repair those. Between the Walker Avenue garage and the library, the Herbert Run Dam outfall, and the creek and road leading to the stadium. And so that will be going on in the coming year. And then, of course, campus beautification. We've added a lot of color to campus over the course of the last year uh, at, at the campus entrance, at biology, biological sciences. And I just want to give kudos to the facilities management grounds crew for their vision and their very hard work. Okay, a group of students, faculty, and staff are maintaining two model projects on campus with our commitment to the environment. The first one, a permaculture forest, uh, permaculture food forest, which is an edible ecosystem of perennial fruit, berry, and nut trees that are configured to restore soil and water systems. Very exciting. That's on the on your left, and then the campus garden, which is made up of plots that are main, maintained by students and our staff. Oops, I hit the red button, sorry. Okay, now for projects that you can expect to be underway this year. The blue dots show those projects. First, 
roof replacements are a really important part of maintaining the useful life of our buildings and maintaining the uh, soundness of your offices and all the materials that you have in them. And so we have this long-term rotational basis for replacing roofs, and in the coming year on the list is physics and engineering. And then finally, now that basketball, volleyball, and athletics administration have moved over to the new event center, we have an opportunity to renovate the building systems in the rack and to reconfigure the spaces. This is gonna be a phased renovation since the building will be occupied over the course of its renovation and the total cost will be $25 million. Programming and design will happen over the course of this year. Over half of the budget is gonna be just on building systems because they are old, they, they no longer work for us. But the rest of the, the project is on expanding opportunities for recreation and wellness for our campus. That's what the spaces are best suited for, and we know that we need more of those kinds of spaces on campus. So um, again, we're gonna be asking for input from the campus community on that during the programming and design phase over the course of the year, but expect there to be more recreation and wellness opportunities for students, faculty, and staff. That concludes this year's facilities update. I hope you enjoyed it, and I want to thank you all for your partnership, your participation, and most of all, your patience as we do all of these projects. Welcome back. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lynn, and good afternoon, everybody. It's been my tradition to tell exactly the same story uh, uh, at uh, our opening meeting uh, for the last uh, six years. Um, um, but I think your patience is probably running out right now. But just in case you didn't know, it does involve me taking, telling the worst joke ever uh, from this podium and Freeman telling me, please, Philip, do not quit your day job. <laughs> And, uh, and as you know, I've, I've followed uh, Freeman's advice uh, religiously uh, here today. Um, first and foremost, I want to start by thanking everyone here today for everything that you've done and will continue to do to support our community and most importantly, our students. Our community has always gained strength by each of us sharing with others our own unique personal story, and we heard some wonderful examples from our students um, today. Roger Kipling once said, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. So perhaps our culture of storytelling here at UMBC represents both our desire and the reality that each one of, uh, of you, each one of us, is such an important part of a shared history. The singular and quite remarkable story of our UMBC community. A community that through commitment and hard work has dedicated itself to creating a new model of the public research university. At the beginning of a new academic year, such as today, we celebrate our accomplishments and of course, look to the future. And I know we're all looking forward to our president delivering this year's State of the University Address. But yesterday, we held our annual university retreat. And at the retreat, we discussed the progress we have made during the past two years in advancing the objectives of our new strategic plan. We shared with retreat participants a comprehensive dashboard or listing showing how each of our divisions and colleges is moving to forward in alignment with our goals and objectives in each of the four focus areas of the strategic plan. Those areas are the student experience, collective impact in scholarship, creative achievement and research, innovation in teaching and learning, and extending the UMBC community and community connections. The dashboard or listing I just talked about can be found on the retreat website. 
retreat.umbc.edu. So I hope everyone can remember that, retreat.umbc.edu. We'll be sending around a message to everybody with, with, with that link, but I wanted to let you know that it is actually there as of today. That dashboard, that listing is available for your review, and I hope you will be impressed by the progress we have made to date, while of course understanding that success is never final, and there is still much more to do given that we're still in the relatively early stages of implementation. Now, of course, I wish today that I had time to mention everything that had been done. Um, I'm not sure that you wish so, um, but I do. Um, in particular, I wish that I could acknowledge in person the hard work of so many people, including everyone in this room, um, towards uh, our progress towards implementation of the plan that leads to our vision and our aspirations for this campus. But of course that's going to be impossible and in fact the dashboard I just talked about exceeds 30 pages, it's nearly 36 pages. So, but I hope you'll take time um, when you can to, to review the material that, that is there. And of course many of the things that we've done together during the past year and over the past couple of years will be reflected in Freeman's remarks today. I thought I'd share with you a couple of personal stories that I shared with the retreat participants uh, yesterday. Um, the first is that as provost, I'm very fortunate um, to be able to, uh, to join with provosts from other institutions from actually across the country and also sometimes across the world. Um, and uh, if, if many of you have been to these types of, of professional conferences and maybe after the conferences, the provosts meet in the, in the bar or the restaurant uh, afterwards. Um, and you're probably, I know what you're thinking right now, you're probably thinking, goodness gracious me, that's a vision of hell. Uh, uh, um, um, and, and in fact, you, you, you might not be far from the truth uh, uh, because of course, uh, you know, as we all know, uh, uh, in many times uh, higher education is, is, is challenging, it's a serious business. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes uh, uh, we can be a, a little miserable in, uh, in, uh, in, in the way that we interact with each other. And what I wanted to tell you is that um, I actually can't stay in any environment like that. And the reason I can't stay in that environment I think is obvious to everybody here. Um, it's such a great honor and privilege to, to be provost here at UMBC, to uh, see all the work that everyone's doing, the progress we're making, the success of our students and our faculty and our staff, and that brings with it an enormous um, optimism uh, for the future. And so that's why you won't find me in a bar uh, after a provost conference. Um, the second story I sort of want to tell you is related to this. Um, I get the opportunity um, to, to travel to other universities, to, to agencies, uh, to companies, um, really to talk about our success here at UMBC. Um, that's of course part of my, and a very valuable part of my responsibility to raise the visibility of UMBC and talk about the great things that are going on here. And I always feel there's a sort of paradox in doing this. Uh, on the one hand, um, doing this is, is, is perhaps the easiest thing in the world because I just need to talk about you and everything that you've done. On the other hand, it's also the most challenging because I, have the, I feel very much the responsibility of representing the hard work and commitment of everyone here in the room and across campus. So I just wanted to share those two stories with you. So in conclusion, I am coming to an end now. Um, this is a time of great opportunity for us and for our UMBC. I feel honored and privileged to find myself speaking to you today and serving as provost. I am humbled by your fellowship and the opportunity to work as one individual to help us all reach our common goal of advancing excellence in education, scholarship, and service to the benefits of all members of our society. I would like to personally thank you all for your support that you've given me during the past year, and I am eternally grateful to you and so proud to be part of the UMBC family. Thank you once again, and I look forward to working with you in the coming year. And now it's my great honor to invite our president to deliver the State of the University Address. Freeman. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. It's been a great day already. The challenge that I face every year is that there is so much to talk about and so many people to congratulate. There's no way in 20, 25 minutes it can be done. And so what I always say is that the, the official speech will be online in the next few days as we complete things, but I will highlight a few today. Let's start this way. Are there any people in the room who've been here for under one year? Stand up, let me see who you are, if you've been here for under one year. Give them all a round of applause, would you? Welcome. We are delighted that you're here. Welcome to all of you. Now, all of those new people keep seated, and I want everybody else to stand for a minute. Everybody else to stand for a minute. Students, this is something I do every year. Um, okay, so if you have been here for five years or under, raise your hands. Five years, give them a round of applause. And you may be seated, those with five years or under. Okay, keep standing if you've been here for more than five. If you've been here for 10 years or under, let me see who you are, raise your hands. Give them a round of applause. Now you may be seated. Okay, if you've been here for 20 years, raise your, or under, raise your hands. Give them a big round of applause. And you may be seated. If you've been here for 25 years or under, raise your hands. Let me see who you are. Give them a round of applause. You may be seated. If you've been here for 30 years, raise your hands. Let me see who you are. Wow, give them a round of applause. Now you may be seated. I'm trying to see who's still left. If you've been here for 35 years, raise your hands. Let me, raise your hands. Wow. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Wow, that's amazing. And you may be seated. So is anybody here more than 35 years today? Wow, you look so young. Give them a round of applause. Congratulations. <laughs> and you may be seated. Is, uh, nobody's been here for 40 years, right? 40 years? Oh my God, give a round of applause. That's, uh, uh, and you should know she came here to elementary school when we had our elementary school. That's why she's been in that long. Thank you. That's wonderful. It's amazing. Did I go before that? Oh, more than 45 years? 46? Oh, wow. Give a round of applause. Mathematics. And that's mathematics. You should know that. That's mathematics. <laughs> Math wins, all right? When Jake was talking, some of you know that um, uh, in the past month and a half, um, our Jim Greenberg died, one of our wonderful former math chairs who became chair at Carnegie Mellon. And when I went there to speak at Carnegie Mellon, after I finished, he got up and he said, I've worked at many places and he was chair at math. He said, UMBC is by far the best. He said that to the Carnegie Mellon people. So give Jim Greenberg a round of applause for being so... <laughs> Each year, as the fall semester begins, we gather to reflect on the current state of the university and to renew our commitment to our guiding principles, supporting people, shared governance, and excellence in education, research, and service. These themes have guided our development as a public research university. Yesterday, as the provost mentioned, about 230 plus Campus leaders came together, about a quarter of them for the first time, to talk about our progress in implementing the plan. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. We are very proud of so many things that have happened during the past year. Uh, let me begin with two that you know about. We played a basketball game and we beat some team somewhere, <laughs> right? And I think we beat UVA by two points. No, by 20 points. Give us a big round of applause. <laughs> You may not know this, there were more than 4,000 articles that appeared around the world telling that story. I never thought I'd be reading in French about UMBC in Paris, in the uh, UMBC in La Keep. It was unbelievable. And Dan Rather's comment on his Facebook page said, um, when they tell you you can't, tell them UMBC. Dan Rather, right? Not a bad idea, right? But perhaps the most significant point is that that made by the New York Times, which said this. It said, Cinderella story, yes. It's true, though, for UMBC and academics, too. 
And what this campus did was to show wonderful news in athletics with two of those students who had 4.0s. Um, amazing story. And then we showed how, though, look at who we are. And one of the papers said, you may not know a lot about UMBC, but Stanford and Harvard and MIT know them well because they send them so many students. Give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> And as you know, we had our first Rhodes Scholar who was from Howard County, uh, and she's off to do a PhD, Naomi, in nuclear engineering at Oxford. Put that in perspective, we are 50 some years old, ours. College Park is a wonderful campus. They've only had two in 140 years, okay? Guaranteed, in the next couple of years, we're gonna have our second. Make no doubt about it. All right, you're looking at the people around the room right now, the students. The, our new students this year, the largest class ever, we have literally 3,000 new freshmen and transfers, about 1,800 freshmen and 1,200 transfer students coming in. Three quarters of them, almost three quarters, will be living on campus. Uh, what's significant is we also had uh, a, a about 3,000 students earning degrees and uh, 2,500 bachelor's degrees, almost 100 PhDs, and the rest were master's students. And we've got hundreds of new students at Shady Grove now, our Shady Grove campus. And we are planning to go from about 700 students there now up to about 2,000. We're putting a lot of emphasis on graduate school growth. Uh, and we're doing a lot of things in building the visibility of research activities to attract more students there, including um, an alumni scholarship for, to bring people back and new master's programs in data science, technical management, and some other programs. And so we expect that enrollment to continue to grow. Well, you heard about the research um, going on involving the, 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 the strategic plan. One theme in that plan is interdisciplinarity. And one example of a, of a step in the right direction is that the Faculty Senate approved changes to our faculty's PNT, promotion and tenure procedures, to more appropriately recognize interdisciplinary teaching, research, and scholarship. And this summer, we implemented a new internship program called CoLab, which brings together students from a variety of disciplines to work on projects together. And we have implemented now a new advanced data analytics infrastructure, building on what we've been doing before with IRADS, our institutional research area, and with Do It, um, which is Department of Information Technology. And we'll see more and more about the, the impact of, of, of the analytics as time goes on. You may or may not know we have been emphasizing the, the need for financial literacy. And so all new students receive this year uh, orientation uh, in an introductory session in financial literacy. And for grad students, we also offer those classes. Most people have not been taught those issues involving finances. The Innovation Fund is doing really well in teaching and learning. We've had now about 30 projects, and we're very pleased about that. We are welcoming a number of people this year, and I want to talk about several of them. Uh, and I want you to, to first of all, uh, we have a new dean of the Erickson School, Dana Bradley, who is replacing Judah Ranch, who did a wonderful job. We have Sarah Shen, who is not new, but who completed the ACE Fellowship recently, the prestigious fellowship down at UMB, and will continue to have an office there because of the close ties between UMB and UMBC. Uh, and she will become, she has just become the Associate Provost for Academic Affairs. Uh, and then we have Martina Buckley, who's in the Provost's office also as Associate Provost for Financial management. And then we heard from Christine Mallison yesterday. She is the new uh, director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship, emphasizing that importance on our campus. And Christy Michael, who's the new director of budget and resource analysis. Paul Dillon, the new police chief, and we thank Mark Sparks for the job that he did. Antonio Silas, who is the Division of Student Affairs, new director of off-campus student services. And then our own alumna, Anika Wayman, who is the new associate dean for, grad, for the Shady Grove Affairs uh, campus, where she will be working with us to launch our new translational life science technology program and administer other programs that are there. Give all of them a round of applause, would you? I won't go through the entire list of all of the accolades from the U.S. News and World Report. Whenever people are not on that list, we talk about the, the flaws in the methodology. But when you're on that list, you, you admit it's a beauty contest and you are beautiful somehow, right? <laughs> so, so we received, we were number seven in most innovative universities in the country. We were 13th among all national universities in strong commitment to undergrad teaching. We were one of the top universities for international students. Really proud, a new category where we've done better than ever. We actually had 12 of our graduate programs 
uh, named by the U.S. News Best Graduate Schools among the top 109 of them in that group. Would you get across the three colleges? Give us a hand for the best of graduate programs. This is a word I want to know. We were also recognized by Times Higher Education, by Forbes, by Business First, by Kiplinger, by Princeton Review, by the Center for World University Rankings, and especially gratifying for the ninth year in a row, we are one of only two campuses now in our state um, listed among the great colleges to work for. That's based on what you say in surveys. Uh, it's a big deal, and we get it in all those categories. There are only a couple of places that get it in all categories. Berkeley is one in Michigan. Give yourselves a hand for being great people to work with please. In terms of research and scholarship, we secured 85 million in extramural awards this year, spending about, expenditures about $76 million. We're in the top 150 universities in federal research and development. Remember there are 4,000 campuses in the country. Uh, the research continues to focus broadly in health equity and policy studies, public humanities, intercultural communications, as well as in the science and engineering areas, in particular areas like atmospheric physics, remote sensing, um, contemporary remediation in the life sciences and, bi and biotechnology and marine biotech and computer information systems and engineering and it goes on and on but in specialized areas we are doing superbly well and getting a lot of grants from a lot of places uh, it was very exciting this year to see a major IBM partnership with us and you'll be hearing more about that and uh, people from across the colleges were involved about 50 IBM executives were here and uh, they had done this once before down at Duke and we were the second campus with which they were doing it, and you'll be hearing some great announcements coming up about our relationship with IBM. Some of you know about the UMBC Hilltop Institute that has about 50 statisticians, economists, attorneys, social scientists who work on, with the state, as a support system for providing expertise on Medicaid. And we get about $9 million a year. They're doing amazing work and have been doing it for a very long time. Many of you went down to Light City, Baltimore this year. We were a major contributor. And I wanted to point out Kelly Bell's work, the Associate Professor Kelly Bell. She had this installation of the herd on the BG Light Arc work. Everybody was talking about it. If you go to the website, you can see it. It was great representation for us. Many people are getting all kinds of awards, and I'll mention a few in a minute. Internationalization is becoming increasingly important on this campus. You know we have students from 100 countries already, but we're becoming much more proactive in a range of activities. I want to give David DeMaria uh, a shout out because of his work as Associate VP for International Education and pushing us in a variety of ways. We've had a 40% increase in study abroad since last year already. We were selected by the American Council and education to be a part of the internationalization laboratory. A number of faculty members have gotten Fulbrights, as we always do. I mean, in Italy and Ethiopia and China, and it goes on. Large numbers of students with Fulbrights studying in Bulgaria, Colombia, Germany, Germany, Malaysia, Mexico, Norway, Ukraine, and it goes on and on and on. And we are now joining the International Student Exchange Program, another consortium that will give more opportunities for our students. We were one of the finalists for the very prestigious global award from around the world, recognized innovation in that education. I have no doubt we will become the winner at one point or another. Um, a number of, of our colleagues are going around the country establishing relationships. One example, Carl, Carl Steiner, our VP for Research, represented us in helping to build uh, this international cybersecurity consortium involving Japan and, and Germany. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, um, Along with him, Anupam Yoshi now chairs a consortium in cybersecurity with the Indian Institute of Technology and with institutions in, in uh, England, Imperial College, and with Japan. Uh, we are very excited about entrepreneurship on this campus. Many things are happening. A lot of our students are taking the entrepreneurship minor and about innovation. Our faculty are getting about half of the applications that they submit to the state for innovation to pass. I mean, it's actually approved millions of dollars as they work on that with faculty. I want to really highlight the work of Linda Dustman as the Entrepreneur of the Year. As you know, has been chairman of, of music, chair of music. She has an app called um, Octava LLC, which is focused on providing tools that allow concert goers to more deeply understand the music, uh, even through their smartphones as they listen to it. 
And so if you haven't looked it up, look it up, but she's getting quite a few accolades for that. I already mentioned that Lynn is the chair of the Kubo this year. Jack Seuss is chair of two national boards of education, of Educause Board, and of IMS Global, which is the organization responsible for educational technology. We have four of our leaders who are members of leadership teams, executive councils for the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. That's Nancy Young, Bob Carpenter, Carl Steiner, and David DiMaria. So we are being represented really well. Christine Ruzon has done a great job as president of the Maryland Career Consortium. We call her the jobs lady. We appreciate that. Every parent wants to know they're going to get a job, right? We've got third, a third of our students going to grad school, but what happens to the others? Undergrad and grad level. Very, very important. Janet Rutledge has been chair of the GRE board for ETS. Um, and then Ryan Odom won the head men's basketball coach, uh, was named the 2018 Hugh Durham National Coach of the Year for College Insider. Give Ryan a round of applause. We're very proud of him. A number of our faculty and staff received awards from the Board of Regents and from us, and their list is printed there. It's very impressive. I want to commend the Women's Center, which celebrated, it's amazing how time passes, its 25th anniversary through a number of special events, including events involving critical social justice that will be continuing this year. And Lee Blaney was named Outstanding Young Engineer Award, was given that award, and Philip Graff was given the Outstanding Young Scientist Award. Derek Musgrove's book, uh, on Chocolate City, A History of Race and Democracy in Washington, D.C., was named one of the best American history books for 2017 by Kirkus Review. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. They are long lists. Please look at those lists. Please don't be offended that I didn't call you. You're all beautiful people. Remember that. All right? <laughs> the uh, student achievements, uh, um, before I get to those, just two points. Uh, as mandated by state legislation, our Human Relations Office, working with Student Affairs, has implemented a successful um, new educational software a approach for students to work on sexual misconduct for training, on that, on alcohol and other drugs, including opioid education, so staff training and collaboration between the Title IX office and human resources, and we're really looking at issues of addiction and ways of supporting people, mapping out their needs, including programs that will be re for recovery and residential components. It is a major issue in our country, and the best we can do is to approach it with a clear head about how to support people in need. I want to mention on your table somewhere, you will see something that talks about retriever essentials. Um, I was so touched by Sarah's talking about some of the issues involving food. You may not know it. This is a campus that has students whose, whose parents are sometimes professors from Hopkins and the other campuses, UMB, others who are from diplomatic families, others from intelligence families, but there's some wonderful young people on this campus, and sometimes not so young, who sometimes are hungry. We don't think that way, but it is true. And I, I want to commend Julie Rosenthal. I don't know if she's here, but she has been pushing that notion. Julie, give Julie a round of applause. I really mean that. Really mean that. It's just wonderful. Just wonderful. You'll see flyers on that because we have an on-campus food pantry for students in need, and I need to say that there are students who are in need, and we want to make sure we're seeing them and giving them support. It's a part of who we are and the values that we have. And then student achievements. We are UMBC Baja Racing. For the new students, that's the car they bring. We were seventh in the world this year. Huge deal. Seventh in the world. And I'm going to go down this list. There are all kinds here. And just hold your applause. So if you've not looked at the YouTube with the Kleptomaniacs, they actually won an international competition. They're really good. It's a co-ed group of the a cappella singing. They're really good. I mean, listen to them, all right? Uh, and then the UMBC mock trial uh, group actually took fourth place at the Yale International. Again, one of the few public universities in that top group. The Retriever Robotics Club was fifth in the World Robotics Competition in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, an interesting one, there is a group called the um, Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement, and they, they have this competition every year called the IOME Challenge, which focuses on economic policy. And one of our students, Evan Avila, won first place in the 2018 challenge. Huge deal. I've been hearing about it all over the country. And then one of our dancers who's just become an alum uh, and who was a Linehan Artist Scholar was so impressive that she won the opportunity for her dance to be performed at the Kennedy Center, Maya Schechter. It's very, very impressive. And the list goes on and on. Give all the students and their achievements a round of applause. The Career Center survey shows that 90% of our students uh, actually end up reporting that they either have 
plans, they have a job, or they're headed to grad school. Large numbers do go to grad school, but we want to make sure students at the undergrad and grad level have the opportunities to move on to either postdoc experiences for grad students or jobs for grads and undergrads. A number of our athletes did extremely well, and for us, it's always about balance. We know that. We are so proud of teams. The men's, women, men's uh, dry, uh, uh, diving and swimming teams won their championship. We're very proud of them. And for me and for many of you, it's also even more important that they had five members, men and women, of the swimming and diving teams who were scholarly All-American uh, as appointed by the coaches there, meaning that balance of high achievement of both, both the academics and the athletics. We had the first basketball player here to be first American East uh, and first member of the entire conference to be uh, uh, first team All-American for honors. That's Joe Sherburn, 4.0 in basketball, uh, who is staying on because he graduated in three years to get a master's in data science while he plays basketball as we win another championship this year. Give us a round of applause for that idea. <laughs> No pressure to anybody, no pressure. Just do your best, you'll be okay. We also had academic All-Americans on the track team, a number of them who received those awards for their academic achievements. So athletes do extraordinarily well here. Uh, Alexander Galise, uh, this, just this month, broke the Danish national record at the international competition. We're very proud, in swimming, we're very proud of him. When I get to, swim, to fundraising, most important, we're now at about $96 million, and Greg tells me we have all the, the pledges in for $100 million, already, which is very good if Greg is here, and he says that in the next few years we'll be at $200 million. <laughs> He's about to have a heart attack over here as I say that. Just kidding, Greg, not quite $200 million. Wait, wait a minute. But the fact is that we have, keep in mind, 25 years ago we didn't have $1 million. It takes a lot to get into. The first $100 million is a big deal. Um, we had a number of wonderful gifts, but I wanted to mention just a couple, the $1.25 million from the Bunning Foundation that will be helping us in working in the humanities. Uh, the major funding involving Lakeland Elementary. Our, we work with inner city schools. Lakeland Elementary has some of the highest math and reading scores in the city this year. Give them a round of applause, would you? We're very pleased about that. And a major Sloan grant, congratulations to economics for producing uh, students who are going to get PhDs in economics. So this grit and greatness campaign continues and we're very proud of it. But I also want to thank all of you for our first giving day, the Black and Gold Rush. It was an amazing success. I want to congratulate everybody in OIA. It was 24 hours and we raised $100,000 and 1,000 donors. Big round of applause for that. It's a big deal. And then the idea of the Maryland Charity Campaign. The average level of giving in the university system of Maryland is under 20% literally under 20%. We won the, the top award because more than 50% of you gave to the Maryland Charity Campaign for people less fortunate. We raised almost a quarter of a million dollars. Big round of applause for doing that. Carl Steiner and Mary Lilly and Kathy Allison, we really appreciate it. We really do. Next year it'll be Nancy Young with Jack, uh, with Jack Seuss as co-chair. You can look on the list and get the, the names of all of our alumni who will be awarded, will be supported this year. I was in Frederick County this morning um, at uh, speaking to the faculty and staff at Frederick Community College, and it was really gratifying. The chair of the board is a young woman who grew up in Montgomery County, went on to law school, and now she's the chair of the board uh, of that of that community college. And she got up and she talked about having to work her way through college and how people at this university cared. And what she said was, I hope we at Frederick will care about our students the way students, people cared about me. People always remember how we treat them. And, and I want to commend you for what you do in treating people so well. And then the budget update, um, most important, we have about a 2% increase. Uh, the overall budget is $451 million for 2019, uh, and about $7 million of that is from the state, about a 6% increase. We got additional funding for opening the Interdisciplinary Life Building. Uh, th to the base, we got $4 million for the amount of money per student. We're trying to increase that amount so we can make sure we are supportive of our students. And probably most important for a lot of people is that we did get a cost of living adjustment. We know, right? The 2%, big round of applause for that, which helps out. I mean, every dollar helps, and we'll keep working to push for that to give people support. You've already heard the things on construction. You have not heard about climate change, and again, I want to commend both Lynn and Matt uh, Baker, because since 2007, when we signed the president's climate leadership commitment, and people said, are you really serious, in 2007, since that time, we have had a 19% decrease 
in our carbon emissions at the same time that we've had a 14 percent increase in space built and an 18 percent increase in the student enrollment. Big round of applause for climate change and for what we're doing. And I didn't get it, but I should have looked up. Huh? <laughs> you tell me later, right? All right. The, uh, I'm on a roll here. I'm on a roll here, all right? Uh, I uh, really want to thank the Shermans. Some of you know this, but they've just given another $6 million to establish a new center for early learning in urban communities. And our own Professor Mavis Sanders will be running that with the Sherman uh, STEM uh, teacher scholars. Uh, Rihanna and Josh do a great job. These are teachers, young people majoring in these disciplines, first math and science for challenging schools, but now for early childhood. Uh, as some of you know, the research shows that first five or six years will be the most important in any child's life. And so we are getting into that more and more and investing and leveraging money from private sources for that, which is very important. When we get, and then the STRIDE program has become a national model for diversifying the faculty. And I want to commend all the people who've been involved in that work. It, it is serious for us to show that our college, our university, not just at the student level, but at the faculty and staff level, can represent what we see in the world and in America. It's very important for students to see people of all types. And then in terms of information technology, big deal, we actually reached the one millionth ticket with, ticket with the Do It Request Tracker. One million, give a round of applause for the one million ticket. And the reason that's so important, it talks about, it was led by Joe Kirby and John Fritz and others, but the reason it's so important is that it shows all those people in uh, IT who help us out. Give them a round of applause for helping us out so much. And then in analytics, you're going to be hearing more and more about the work that John Fritz and Bob Carpenter are involved in, about student success. Catherine Cole is doing an amazing job in looking at how we make sure our students are doing well. And what I want you to think about is this. The question we should all ask is this. Is UMBC a university where we would want the loved ones in our family to attend? whether it's our sons, our daughters, our spouses, our partners, is this a place where our family members should at least seriously consider? People decide where they want to go, but I am so delighted that many of the faculty and staff in this room have sent kids here and have gone on to do really well. Uh, Bob in the bookstore's daughter came and amazingly went on to Duke and PhD in environmental science, honestly, and I can go on and on with the people, the chief of police daughter who's now working at Google who worked in Germany, I mean the deputy chief, Paul's daughter. I can go on and on with faculty and staff whose sons and daughters are here. But the reason I say it is this, we are so good at what we do. We are nationally known for caring about people. And yet I would argue, and I think you would all agree, we still have work to do. There are still students who may not be the very top student, but who are solid, who are not necessarily doing as well in the first year STEM courses. We're doing a lot of things to help them out right now to make sure that they succeed. Because when students come here, they know they have to work hard. There's no doubt about that. I want to support all of us as we find ways of making sure that students who come, whether they're our children or somebody else's children, really are given the best opportunity to succeed. You know, Culture has everything to do with the substance of a place. If you've not read The Geography of Bliss, it says that culture is the sea we swim in, so pervasive, so all-consuming, that we really don't appreciate it until we get out of it and look back at it. I challenge us to put the mirror up to ourselves and to ask two questions. One, why do we do the work that we do? And two, how can we Imagine, envision being even better than we are, which has everything to do with supporting the staff and the faculty and our students and the people in the communities around us. You've often heard me at the end quote Aristotle that excellence is never an accident. It is a result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the wisest option among many alternatives. And then he said something that I always say gives me goosebumps. He said, choice not chance determines destiny. Choice, not chance determines destiny. A young colleague last year looked at me and she raised her hand. She said, but what about the people who don't have the chance to make a choice? And I continue to think about that, that so many of our students are blessed to have great parents and others to support them. And others have been challenged by life. 
What is noble about this university is that we care about both. We want to make sure that every student, regardless of background, undergrad and grad, has that chance to make a choice and that the future will be bright for them. And so I challenge you, as I always say, to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. Students, I tell all the students, your character has everything to do with who you are when you don't think anybody can see you, when your mother's not there. Ah, what will you do? <laughs> character. So thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become character. Watch your character. It becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. UMBC, we are such a special place. And we can be even better. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And before we sing the alma mater, uh, two things. Homecoming will be October 4th through the 14th, and we've got the annual alumni awards. Go online and look at all, and a lot of shows. The Grid X show, the Grid X talks that I didn't mention, uh, the TED Talks here, which are really great, involving a variety of people and their other activities. Please get involved in all of those things. Um, we're going to now sing the alma mater. So would you please stand? Nobody leave as we sing the alma mater. And if there are anybody with hats on, take your hats off. This is for respect. you got the words there. Nobody leave out of respect. We'll be through in a minute. Please keep stated. All right? And somebody's. And remember, we're welcoming new students. So everybody, if you see somebody lost, give them support. All right? So the music's going to start, because I know you don't want me to start. Wait a minute. Congratulations.